This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is comedy writer Rob Long, who served as the producer of the great sitcom Cheers for years, writes the weekly Martini Shot commentary, and co-hosts the Glop Culture podcast with Jonah Goldberg and John Podhoritz. At a live event in New York City, I spoke with Rob about whether Hollywood is out of ideas, what it's like being a libertarian-leaning conservative in a very progressive industry, and the role that psychedelics have played in his creative process. Here is The Reason Interview with Rob Long. Earlier today, I talked to Rob, and I had sent him a note saying, like, let's, what are we going to talk about? And he said, to be honest, I'm sort of way more interested in issues of faith and the big questions, capital B, capital Q these days. The three things that I think a person is going to have to understand for the future are the blockchain, machine learning, and Jesus. <laughs> so let's start with that. Can you talk a little bit about What's going on with blockchain, machine learning, and Jesus? Yeah, um, I, uh, I guess what I meant by that was that uh, the, the cliche is always that, you know, we, we know so many things now and all the mysteries are gone in life. And so really, where does faith belong, right? Because we're all very smart and we know that the dragon isn't chasing the sun across the sky every day. Um, so what do you need to know? Like if the if these things are all kind of fading away, what do you what what are the thing three things you need to know? And one is the blockchain, really, which I think is interesting technology, and it's going to be the uh, universal ledger for payments and chain of title and copyrights and all sorts of things. And the it's idea kind of that like the book of names, kind of like the book of names. Yes, right? exactly. Oh, good yeah. free. Wow. Mm. Oh. Um, and then the second thing I think is machine learning. We all know the machine learning is big and it's going to be bigger and it's going to be a part of our lives no matter whether we like it or not. Um, it's either going to be something we carry around in our pocket. Or it's going to be something that we have that's going to be our, our off-site um, brain. There's a very good uh, app now called Mem, which is, I think it's still in beta, but you can join it and it, you create your own knowledge base. You can put everything you've ever written. You can put all of your your journals in there. You can put anything you want in this, in Mem, and it creates a knowledge base based on what you've written and what you've said and what you've thought and what you put in. And you can say, hey, Mem, what do I think about daffodils? And it'll say, well, you know, as a matter of fact, you've been thinking a lot about daffodils. Um, and then the third thing is Jesus, which is, I'm, you know, I, I mean that in the capital J, but also in the, the, the idea that there's got to be something that we are doing here with ourselves and each other that is going to legitimize and um, detoxify the first two. And um, as I get older, I think that's what I'm, I think about more. Uh, what, what, are, what are we doing here? And so, yeah, why, why Jesus, though, in, in the sense of you're, you're reaching for a religious figure yeah. and you're not going for Buddha, uh, you're not going for Abraham. And I'm an Episcopalian. I, I'm, 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 you know... 58 year old wasp. I'm going to go for what I, I know. Like, you can go for it if you want to know. Like, God has a 99 faces or whatever they say. But, like, for me, that's who it is. And uh, also, I kind of like the fact that most people, especially in Hollywood, um, it is the most terrifying word that you can use. <laughs> if you could bring a, a, I had a friend of mine who was pitching a great, really great um, series uh, about the, the history of the development of the Glock, you know, the handgun, the Glock, which is this great, lurid story. If you know the story, the development of the Glock. Uh, handgun it's fantastic um and it has everything in it. it has sex and violence and madness and it's terrific and and uh and he wanted to bring into the pitch he wanted to bring a glock um and put it on the table and just have it there during the pitch and half the people he was working with said this is a great idea and the other half said this is a terrible idea <laughs> um but had he done that he never did it had he done that he still would have gotten a better response than i would do if i walked into a any any pitch meeting and said, I got it. Okay. It's about Jesus. No, wait, stop. Yeah. Let me finish before they send me out. Because so it's terrifying. This people are putting terrified. the crucifix on the table. Yeah, exactly right. That's scarier yeah. than a clock. I want to bring you the good news. Like I know, I'm not that guy. So I mean, you you talk about, you know, partly what you're dealing with is a world of abundance as opposed to scarcity, right? So like and this is part of right. things like uh, machine learning and AI and bit you know, blockchain. You know, we most of us and increasingly across the uh, across the globe 
uh, Brookings, uh, the Brookings Institution a few years ago tabulated that most people around the planet are now living at a middle class level or above for the first time in history. I mean, it's Makes like sense. amazing, like in, in not in a perfect way, but in a profound way, we've beaten scarcity. Um, and that leaves more time for symbolic work. Yeah. Uh, also, I like feel it. like we, um, I mean, you and I talked about this, like, uh, uh, there's nothing more irritating to me than people who uh, begin their political philosophy or their social philosophy or whatever their position is based on scarcity, that there's not enough and that we need, uh, we need to conserve the good stuff that we have. And I just think that's completely wrong. Um, and it's kind of a pose rich people usually use so they don't have to give anything away. Um, and it's just, it's belied by all the facts. And, and when you tell people that, like today was the best day to be alive on the planet in the history of the planet today. And tomorrow will be a little bit better than today. You stub your toe tonight and you're not gonna die of sepsis. You're just not. And um, that's just not the case not that long ago. So, um, and, and not, you know, not to like a lay a lot of Christian stuff on you because we all, you know, we're all just as God made us or whoever made us. And I, I'm not, it's a whole bunch of stuff I don't believe, by the way, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm the, I'm the worst person to be having this conversation. But the message is, um, okay, what are you worried about? You're worried that you're, you're going you're to be lonely. You're worried you're not, that's not going to be enough love for you. You're going to worry that you're not going to have any of the things that you want. You're going to worry that when you die, you're just going to disappear. Um, big, deep fear, fears. And then along came a guy 22,000 years ago, and he said, okay, don't worry about that. You're fine. Everything's fine. You're going to be fine. Now what? So now what do you do in a world of abundance? which is something that we don't want to think about. So we prefer to go back to our scarcity, right? Because it's much easier to think about what I don't have than like, oh, everything's fine. Because in my faith tradition, which is not probably, um, I know it's not yours, but it's like, uh, you know, it's not probably even uh, capital C Christian. Whatever, what has been, what we say, what, what has been given was given to be given again. Um, and in a world of abundance, uh, what we're called to do is to, we're called to give. And, uh, and that is like not easy and um, actually not that pleasant. So I like what, my what, are you, what do you give? Like how, do, I mean, make this concrete. What, what does it mean? Well, I'm terrible. No, I, this, I consider this, you know, <laughs> like, I, like I'm bad at it. I'm really bad at it. Like I, you know, you, know, you walk by the guy and like I, you walk by the homeless guy. And I've been on the board of a homeless youth agency in LA for 30 something years. And mostly what we're told- And you're happy to report you have more homeless there now than ever. Yeah, we've been so doing a great job. I don't know if good. you noticed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get what you, the, the, all systems work. That's what you learn. They, they, you get what you, the system. Um, and uh, you, uh, anyway, what I said was like, a, you know, partly you say to yourself, well, I, the, the goal here is to drive them to services. So you don't give them money because you give them money, you're just going to encourage them. You want to drive them services, which is probably true. But um, I don't know what the hell. Just I got a few bucks. I don't like my. I'm not going to solve the big problem. I'm just not. So I'm just going to do one little nice thing, and it may be detrimental in the large scheme of things. But I don't. I don't care anymore. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's probably a dis, an unsatisfying answer to most people, but that's mine. Did you have, was there a moment when, uh, did you have a Damascus Road experience uh, where you're like, okay, rather than talking about scarcity and rather than living my life as if things are being taken away from me, I'm, I'm in a different space. Like, what? where did that transformation um, I, come from? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of things, like when you get to be a certain age and you work in show business, you know, it's a problem. It's like, you know, you you open the variety and it says, uh, you know, show running veteran. I'm like, I mean, I'm veteran. I'm, I feel like I'm a very vibrant young man, right? I mean, I started when I was 24. So I was like a kid. That's my first, my only job I've ever really had has been walking into a room, sitting on a sofa and trying to make jokes for people. That's really literally it. I mean, that's it. And you get to be a certain age and like, you know, like, well, this, you're not working quite, you're not, you, nobody's calling you the way they used to. Um, and then the money gets smaller because the money in show business has gotten smaller for everybody. And then you start to think, okay, well, 
what does this mean? Like, am I, do I still exist? Do I, do I, what do I, what am I going to do? And that's sort of a little mini crisis you have. And you think, well, what if I just didn't have any of the things that I have? Um, how bad would that be? And it, you know, really bad. I mean, that's the first thing you think is really bad. And then you think, okay, well, what, what else, what else do I got? What am I here for? And so it wasn't really a road to Damascus so much. It was a road to my, you know, my, my accountants who said when I moved to New York, he said, this is like, are you, what are you thinking about? Are you, are you not working? You, do you have, is there another accountant somewhere who has a, a access to other money that I don't know about? Uh, and I said, no, I'm just going to just see what happens. And um, I mean, what's happened, of course, is that you, that you, you got to work, it turns out. Um, but I don't have to do this. I can do whatever I want. And I think that's part of the road was like, okay, well, if I'm okay, then why am I okay? Could you put this in a larger context as we're in, you know, we're in a society right now, we're, we're in a political moment. I, I wouldn't necessarily say this is true of society, but when it comes to politics, things are extremely polarized. Uh, the, you know, the major parties have smaller market share than they had 50 years ago or even 20 years ago, but they're, the, the dead enders in them are more vociferous and more committed than ever. Um, is are they responding to the same thing you are but they're saying i need to hang on to this because this is all i have or you know and then if that's true how do, how do you connect with people like that so that we become less polarized and more uh yeah. you know kind of uh centered around something like the common good it was much easier when we didn't know how dumb all of our neighbors were and all the stupid things that they believed and now we do. Uh, and that's because of social media. Yeah, everybody's telling yeah. you, well, they have, everybody's got an opinion. They can tell you their opinion. Like Everybody in this room is going to tell you their opinion if they want. Um, so that was sort of better then um, when you didn't really have to know these things. Like you could kind of live your life. Um, I, 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 so I don't know whether we, we, we always use, I, I don't, I should say, I have often thought about things happening in culture as things that are happening to me and not things that I am doing. Uh, we're all very polarized, we say. No, I think we're polarized, our, we're polarizing ourselves. Um, and you can feel it. You could sometimes tell them, like, really smart people will suddenly get really angry when they discover that you're not voting for the candidate they want you to vote for, or that you have some weird, slightly divergent attitude about some world event that isn't, you're not wearing the jersey, like put the jersey on. Um, I used to joke that when I was in, in 2020 that, um, you know, I'd read the paper, the New York Times or something, and there's some, some, what I would consider to be crackpot liberal progressive politics. And I'd say, these people will not rest until I'm wearing the MAGA hat. They want me to wear the MAGA hat. And I'm, I don't want to wear the MAGA hat. I don't believe in the MAGA hat. I don't support the MAGA hat. But for some reason, the editorial board of the New York Times, they wake up every morning and they think, how can we piss him off so much? How can we be so weird that he's just going to wear the MAGA hat? And so partly it's my fault, which is to not thread the needle my own way. Is that an answer? I don't know if it is. I think it might be. Talk about, you know, what is, what is the, uh, the image of Jesus then? Because you, you talk about Jesus, right? You mentioned him in your opening uh, comments. How, what, do you, what do you kind of reflect, refract through him? Or, you know, what, what does he symbolize in this? Well, you know, he's a genuinely weird dude um and i'm not sure i believe all the stuff you're supposed to no i mean you're, you're a good catholic you probably went and i'm a very bad catholic which is you're say the best kind catholic boy yeah, yeah. The, best uh, kind. Uh, uh, the nicene creed the apostles creed all that stuff like, oh, i don't know if i believe in that um i don't know if i'm supposed to i don't really think that he wants me to so um i think the part it's easy and hard right he said uh you know, you only have two commandments, love God and then love each other as you, as God loves you, right? So you take, you take the gift and then you give it away. I don't like that. That's hard, right? I'd much rather, you know, be a consultant in Christianity for other people, you know, you know rather preach than live, right? And then the second thing he says uh, is um, if you have two, it's very simple. If you have two coats, give one away. And so for 2,024 years, there's been a, uh, a, 
endless amount of writing and thinking and philosophy and uh, and exegesis of that because like, he can't possibly mean that he just thinks you should give one of your coats away because that's just like first of all I like my coats I have really nice coats some are cashmere some are like Laura Piana like he can't mean instead of giving that away I think what I'd rather do is um, depending on the year I'd rather like uh, make like dif make like difficult for some some Jews or some gay people or like you know find some more doctrinaire way to like exhibit my faith rather than the, the way that he's asked you to, which is to just give one of your coats away or see his face in the, 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 the Jungian thing, the last person on earth you'd imagine or would want to see his face in. That's the person whose face, that's who you, that's, that's the call. Right? How many coats do you, if I go to Rob Long's apartment, how many coats do you have hanging there? Can you even count them? I only have one. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, uh, that's the thing. It's like, I am so shitty at being a Christian that I should be something else. But um, that doesn't make it wrong. It actually kind of like, it's one of the ways you know it's right is that I can't bring myself to do it. Do you, is there a different, you know, so Christianity, Judaism, Islam are all Abrahamic religions, right? Um, they seem to have, you know, they all worship kind of the same God or concept, um, but they're, they seem to be very different. Um, you know, why is your guy Jesus as opposed to Moses? Because he's like, or, a, he's a groovy. You know, like he's the groovy one. He's the one who's like a very short book. Uh, and a lot of it's the same story, just told in a different way. Um, so really short, uh, cryptic. Um, and then slippery, a lot of stories. Like that's like that's kind of what I like. I like stories, um, and not as interested in um, your social status or how much money you have or whether you um, even go to church. Not that interested in it. And that 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 kind of speaks to me. What um, you know what. What do you do with the amount of um, hell talk that Jesus brings? Uh, you know, because the Old Testament has some visions of hell, but it's really like eternal damnation is a Christian thing, and it's a New Testament thing. Um, you know, God is love, but God is also the one who's talking about throwing people into, or Jesus throwing people into a lake of fire that they'll never get out of. Um, how does that fit into this? I ignore that part. I just do. I just, it was written by dudes. There's a lot of stuff in it that doesn't go together. It's This not, is the show writer in you. You're like, yeah, yeah that I, lake I, of fire yeah, stuff that's Years played. and years ago, a friend of mine was uh, working with Stephen J. Cannell. I know oh, yeah, I, yeah, some of you sure. know, a great producer, produced a, a Magnum P.I. And, and a I'm like, million a Rockford file. Yeah. Rock yeah. file um, and they wanted to do a Baywatch but instead of at the on the bay, it was going to be set on the border. Bay watch on the border. It's so sexy. Yeah, and it was kind of funny, you know, you know, people border patrol. You know, and so they when they pitched it, and someone said, "Well, um, what are you going to do about like the miserable stuff happening on the border, like the, you know, the mountain of skulls in Ciudad Juarez and the cartels and the people coming over and getting eaten by wolves? And what are you going to do about that?" And Cannell said, uh, we're not going to write that part. <laughs> Which is a great answer, actually. Because, yeah, you just don't write it. And no, no one says, you know, I would enjoy this show more if it was more depressing. I would enjoy the show more if there was more, you know, human misery on screen. No one ever says that. So um, so the Lake of Fire stuff, like, I'm not qualified to, to, to uh, uh, analyze it. But the people that I know who, like, speak the thing the languagey stuff, um, that's the technical term. And dig up the things from the jars. Uh, it's not quite the lake of fire, it's something else. So I, I sort of believe that it's, uh, hell is what we put ourselves through on earth. What, um, you know, how do, how do are, are people then, I mean, they're suffering, would you agree they're suffering from too much freedom uh, in the sense of like, they have more options in lives. They have more ability to create the world and the meaning that they want. And on some profound level, you know, let's say in the United States at least, are we 
doing, I think it was Eric Fromm who talked about the escape from freedom. Is that what's going on, that uh, our material needs are basically met? Yeah. We're way up on Maslow's hierarchy, and like we're like, forget it. I don't want, I don't want to deal. No, oh, the anxiety of choice is really there. There. I mean, anyone who's ever tried to watch TV in, you know, yesterday, it's like, what? I, I, I mean, I used to come home from work and, you know, flop on the sofa and turn on the TV and flip through stuff. And I could flip through. Flipping through, by the way, was a, a, a show. I, I enjoyed that on my direct TV. I just flipped through everything. You, if it was a movie, oh, my cousin Vinny, I'm going to watch that. And then something else, oh, it's going to be the guy. Whatever, you'd stop. And that would be watching TV. And you'd have to make a choice. Now, of course, you have to make a choice about everything, right? what your destination is, you have to know. Um, so that I think that's the anxiety of that. But it seems to me we're more interested and more obsessed and more, in, and more like exercised by the choices other people are making. It's like we can hear their voices now. And so like, I don't know, I don't know what that guy is doing. Like, like, I think it's dumb to walk around wearing a mask. I think it's dumb. Um, you want to wear a mask? I don't care. Go ahead, wear a mask. If that's your thing. I saw a woman in San Francisco um, in last, I was there um, last autumn in one of those Waymo, you know, Google taxis alone wearing a mask in the, in the robot car wearing a mask, which I thought was perfect. That's exactly, she's, she's at the pinnacle of technology. This is something that people are dreaming about for a thousand years. This thing that takes, obviously going to kill a bunch of people. These things don't work, but you're just going to like, and she's still, I got to wear, and like that's, I think the fear of choice, right? The, what if I don't have to worry about that stuff and I, I prefer it. You know, there's a, here's a horrible image. Um, but it's true. They used to, uh, they used to have these diving things with kids. Have you ever taught kids swimming in the old days? And they would, you know, to get them used to the pool, they would you throw in something heavy. And they would dive in and they would grab it and they would come back up and they'd bring the heavy thing up. To, and it was the one way to get them. And some kids drowned because they held on to this thing that was heavy and it took them to the bottom of the pool and they just forgot to let go. And it sounds horrible and completely like bananas, but it also sounds really human. And that's the thing you want to think about. It's like, what am I holding on to that I could just let go of? And then I could rise to the top. And be this seems like a uh, good moment to introduce psychedelics into the conversation. <laughs> and it's something positive. I'm very yeah, sorry. And the, by the way, I could have said that. Thursday. I could have said that at any moment in yeah, this conversation. Right, right, so. right, right, right. Uh, no, but um, you, you've talked about uh, your experiences with psychedelics and how that has helped you kind of move through difficult periods in life or clarify your thinking. How does that fit into, you know, this larger kind of topic that you're discussing? Well, everybody's different. Everybody's brain is different, kind of, actually, but also like not that different. You know, we're not really that different. Um, for me, it was more like, uh, I know I, I went to Costa Rica and I did uh, ayahuasca for five days straight, which is exhausting. How did you come to that? Like how you were like- Oh, because uh, I was doing these weird, I was doing a bunch of uh, psychedelics kind of like on my own. And um, I suddenly thought, I don't know anything about this. I was, I'm not a, I never took drugs. I mean, in college, I think it was like, we did cocaine. God, I hope my mother doesn't hear this, but we did. And I was like, mm, you know, I don't know. I, I never, I don't, I don't need anything to help me stay awake or be, um, well, I need something to say, we'll stay awake, but I mean, to be more, have more fun at a party. I don't need that. Um, although this is, it's all I need. Uh, so I was doing all that stuff and I thought I should like, I'm a gentleman of a certain age. I should make sure this is okay. Like, I don't, I don't want to have a, you know, some embarrassing right. you know, medical event. So I, uh, went, I was living in New York and I went and I Googled this is the house of my thinking. I thought psychiatrists, because they're an MD, uh, who do ketamine therapy. Because my theory was, if you're a shrink who does ketamine therapy, you're going to be cool with all this other stuff that I'm doing. You can't, you know, you're not going to be able to draw the line. And I found one who was great. And, uh, and he ended up being, he's kind of an influential guy in the world and was very helpful for me. And so I started going to him just because I want to know, I'm not going to get a heart attack and die. I'm not going to, this is like, uh, how do I, how do I do this? And he was very helpful. Um, and then I saw him for like a two months, three months. And then, um, and then my dad died. And, 
and then I started seeing him just because of that, because that was very, you know, very painful. Um, and then I ended up saying, I just want to do this ayahuasca stuff. And he says, well, I know a place. I helped set it up. And so I went down to this place. And uh, it's exhausting. And, um, and uh, the message there was that I got, right? A lot of messages in ayahuasca, which is like some people I was there with um, would say like that night or the next morning or something, you know, I went to the undersea kingdom and mother ayahuasca showed me the daffodil people or whatever. And I'm like, I, I just, I walked in my grandparents' house and then suddenly I was in middle school. I didn't see any undersea kingdom. I didn't have any of that. I don't, I don't have that part of my brain works. I don't, I don't like, the Lord of the Rings. I hated that movie so much. I don't the, the Hobbit stuff. The three body problem. Everybody loves. So dumb. I hate. It. I don't have a. I do not have an imagination. I like me. I want to think about me and my life, and so that helped. Uh, um, because I discovered what. Oh, here, here's what I was. So when I came back, um. I was having dinner with some friends of mine, and one guy who was not really my friend, but he's kind of a, you know, we all have these jerky friends. And uh, I said, I just got back from Iowa, from uh, Costa Rica, I did ayahuasca for a week. I was, uh, you know, I'm just gonna have water. And he goes, Oh, really? How was that? Did you have any revelations? And he's one of those guys, right? <laughs> did you see God? Did God show up? I'm like, no, oh, no. Did you? Oh, no. You have? Did you have any revelations? And I'm like, Well, I did last night. I did. And he's like, Oh, everybody quiet. I'm gonna hear the revelation. What was the big revelation? And I said, well, last night, um, after like a lot of stuff, but last night I just was just sitting there in this hut in Costa Rica and like it was raining outside. It was really pretty. And I heard this voice, which was either my voice or somebody's voice or just maybe it was the wind, who knows, saying over and over again for hours, it felt like, these uh, five, six words. There is so much time left and his response was will you send me the link to that place <laughs> and I said this when I did my when I did my radio commentary I said it um, on uh, KCRW so it was on public radio and uh, I got I mean I would talk about show business for I was I did this for 16 years and uh, you know, every now and then somebody would like write me an email or something, or I'd go to a meeting and people say, oh, I liked the thing you did last week. I got so many responses from that one, from people sending me emails with domains like jpmorganchase.com and you know, crevasswain.com, like places where people clearly are looking for something. What do, you, what do, what do you think that speaks to? Is it um, you know, the idea that we're stuck in a you know a kind of rat race or a status trap. Um, you mentioned being a wasp, so you know as somebody who has raised Irish and Italian Catholic, I had a very I I don't, I don't think I ever met a wasp until I went to college. And, yeah, you but, know but and that's I, how we arranged it. Yeah, yeah, and you have like a vision of them as particularly emotionally stunted. If ethnic, you know, if white ethnics are to emotional wasps like have no emotion. Is that what was being unleashed in you or, or and do you I still like to think of myself as having no emotion. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't know, like I think that's probably true. I, or it just or it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, which was like, uh, um, and it's something I really believe, which is that um, there is so much time left. Every, everything you need to do to make your life full, to forgive people, to forgive yourself, to love people, love yourself. You can do it in an instant. You can do it right now. You, you do not need, psychedelics are, uh, uh, are neither necessary nor sufficient. Said my old shrink, by the way, who was, was kind of a really good way to put it. Psychedelics are neither necessary nor sufficient for healing, right? But everything you need to do, you can do right now. There is plenty of time left. And um, that tends to be, at least for me, what I had the hardest time accepting. So I always felt like, oh, I'm late. I'm late. Uh, it's, oh, it's, I'm just, it's no, I miss, I miss that. It's, there's so much time left. Well, um, talk about that a little bit more. What, you know, um, so you're not late for your life. Your life is unfolding yeah. as you're living it. But how do, you know, is it just something you toss off? Like, you know what, I, I no longer feel 
that I wasted my life or that my life is over or that the party is over before I show up. Yeah, I think it's more like, um, it, I mean, I'm a writer, so, and I, and I'm, for, for 30 years, I wrote very practical, my, my, my output was very practical. It's either about my life specifically, about my business specifically, and about the people in my life specifically. So I did that on the radio and I did that. I wrote two books about it. Like that's like, you know, very specific. Um, or it was four characters that I had created or had been created. And I was trying to like pitch to that guy that whoever that guy is, I wanted to like get his voice. Um, and which is great, by the way, I, I loved it. I still love it. It's great. It's lots of fun, but it's not the same thing as writing what you feel or who you are. And at a certain point, if you're that kind of writer, you think, well, I can't really tell you who I really am because um, that's not the job, it's not the gig. And uh, and if you write humor especially, which is this weird combination of um, incredibly aggressive behavior, right? I mean, if you wanna make people laugh, that's an aggressive act, right? It's not, you're, you're changing the way they breathe. You're choking people. Like, it's like when you laugh, you're like, oh my God, I'm like, <gasps> and, and like, that's the kind of, it's kind of a weird aggressive thing that you do to people. Um, and then on the other, so the one hand it's very aggressive. On the other hand, it's desperately, desperately needing um, approval. So it's like this weird, crazy dichotomy that um, can get in the way. Or it can also like, you know, I don't know, like it, you, can, you can make a nice living at it. I mean, you can really make a really nice living in, especially in show business, uh, not being yourself. But eventually you run out of string and you gotta like, I don't know, what am I gonna, I'm like, I'm a show, I'm a show running veteran yeah, and not a, and not a writer. Yeah. Do you, uh, some people talk about psychedelics as non-specific amplifiers or yeah. drugs where, you know, rather than giving a particular insight across time and across individuals or circumstance that they basically make people into a, a bigger version of themselves. Do you think that's true or do you feel like your experiences cuts across that? I can't be true. I think it could be true. I, I, it depends on how you approach it. I mean, uh, all the MDMA trials, not all of them, but the ones I've read about, certainly the ones that the maps has just finished that are pretty amazing. Um, uh, those are people who've been, the people don't even have severe trauma of some kind. Um, you know, what we rec all recognize as like, oh, that was serious. Not somebody saying, I was really traumatized by my, you know, parents being, you know, mean to me about my grades. That's not that. Um, and so I think that MDMA is, is not an, does not amplify the feelings of trauma, of being traumatized. It amplifies the feelings of being okay. So, uh, but for me, I feel like maybe I just haven't, um, done enough, which is hard to believe, but, uh, there is so much time. There's so much time left. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't think I've ever had a psychedelic experience that I didn't want to end so I could go back and be in the world. Like I, ne I every time I've done it, I've thought, oh, I can't wait to not, to not be in this room with this person and I'd be out. So if anything, it amplified my, my desire to sort of be with people. Um, before, it, have you felt that? I, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, would, I need to think about that. Yeah. I, mean, I think we should do a little singer series with you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You know. I'm going to open that hood. Yeah. All right. That's, uh, yeah, that's a big. See what's uh, in there. That's a big uh, pit. You yeah. Know, well, no, sure. I'm, I didn't say it was going to be uh, pretty. Yeah. Um, let's uh, before we go to questions, uh, let's talk a little bit about Hollywood. And one of the things that you've come back to over the years is the unwilling, the seeming unwillingness of Hollywood, if some you know kind of reified industry still exists that can be called Hollywood, is there unwillingness to really try to have big hits? that they seem to, you know, Cheers is a good example. And Cheers, maybe one of the last shows, even more than Seinfeld, which kind of moved into its slot, 
Um, but Cheers was the number one show, and it had a massive audience uh, for its time that you just don't see anymore. Um, what is driving, you know, what is what is driving Hollywood not to try and do these kinds of massively popular shows or movies or books? Yeah, I mean, there's 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 three things, right? One is just the realities that the audience is atomized and that we're all watching something different and there's a giant streaming service than, you know, there's unlimited store width, unlimited bandwidth leads to this kind of like separation. That is true. And so if you ask anybody who runs one of these companies or is, is strategizing here, they will say that is the, that is the reason. Um, and maybe, partly. I'm not going to say it isn't. But the other part is just this fear and or I shouldn't say fear, it's this unwillingness to accept that show business, the entertainment business, is utterly impossible to plan or organize or predict. You cannot reverse engineer a hit. You cannot do it. And there are a lot of people in entertainment business now who are like, well, that can't be true because I got a Harvard MBA and we learned how to build a system. And if I could just build a system right – then we wouldn't have to. I wouldn't need to like take pictures and like take flyers, and I wouldn't need to treat this as a venture business that basically fails a lot. Um, and when it succeeds, it's like succeeds in a way that I couldn't predict. Um, the problem with show business now is that so many very very smart people are in it. It was much better when it was just dumbasses, just you know, making decisions on the seat of their pants and saying, that show sound, that sounds interesting, let's do that. It was much better. The hit ratio was much higher. It's, uh, so, it's, so it's arrogance and fear. And then it's the, this third thing, which is the idea that like, um, it's too, um, it's, it's like a, we all got very smart about business right, in the 80s and 90s. And so these are people who think like, okay, well, it, it, how different could it be from making Oreos? It can't be different. And of course, it's totally different. And um, nobody wants to believe that. Nobody, you can, I, I remember Brandon Tartikoff, who ran uh, NBC for a long time, uh, left NBC, then was the chairman at Paramount, chairman of Paramount Studios. And, uh, and, so, and he was kind of an interesting character. And this is a million years ago. Um, and this was before Par Paramount was then owned by, um, it was a Gulf of Western company then owned by, then changed to Paramount Communications. And, um, so the owners, uh, the, the CEO of Paramount was in New York. And uh, the uh, Gulf Western building was where Trump, uh, Trump has a building in Columbus Circle. Now. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Maybe, yeah. And one day he wakes up, one Sunday he wakes up Monday morning and he reads the New York Times Sunday Magazine and they did a magazine piece on Brandon Tartikoff. And Tartikoff says, and the poll quote is, um, basically what I do is a crapshoot. And... Uh, he was fired, basically. He was fired within six months from saying that. Because uh, Martin Davis, who ran Paramount, was like, D you can't say that. It isn't. First of all, it isn't. It's a lie. And second of all, you can't say it because uh, I have shareholders who expect that, that this is not a crapshoot. Um, the thing is that it's crapshoot. Actually, it's not a crapshoot because a crapshoot, like those are pretty good odds. Actually, the best odds of the casino are craps, right? It's it's this it's a slot machine. It's like it's like it's rigged against you. You're going to the movie you think is going to be great is going to die. The TV show that you've put all this effort and money into is going to die. If you're Amazon Studios today, you spent a billion dollars in The Lord of the Rings, which seemed like a no-brainer, and it's a disaster. It cost them a million, zillion, billion dollars and another half a billion dollars to sell. Nobody's buying it. And the show that's keeping the lights on, if it wasn't already on, is a show called Reacher, which is about a giant man mountain of a guy who just moves to a town and kills all the bad guys in the most elaborate ways you can imagine, and then goes to another town. And it's stupid and great. And I guarantee you nobody at Amazon said, you know, Reacher. They didn't say that. You don't know. And um, that's the bad, that's, it, it, you should come into the office every day saying, I don't know shit about shit. I'm just going to say yes to stuff that seems interesting. And when they don't do that, it's when they get in trouble. But there's, but there's no fix for it. And if you don't like that, don't be in show business. It's like th these are terrible businesses to invest your money in. They are terrible. The ROI on a, in a show business uh, share of a show business company is just ridiculous. And, um, and that's fine. There's no law that says that everything's got to be a big 
uh, you know, shareholder bonanza. This is not. This is crapshoot. Not even that. And the ones who succeed, succeed for a few years, and then they, they get unlucky. That's People got fired in show business for years for being unlucky. And that is the way it's supposed to be. And instead, now they're fired because they missed their quarterly, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, they actually don't get fired. Nobody do gets you, fired. Do you think, given the vast amount of stuff that gets produced every year, plus everything that was ever produced is available somewhere, yeah. are we in a golden age of content uh, production? Or does it does that become a problem where there's just too much stuff and we can't really focus? And, you know, a great show is it can be kind of aesthetically perfect and wonderful, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't have a certain size audience, that that's part of the, the, the thing that makes it great. Well, um, it, in olden times, meaning 10 years ago, um, you could only really make money if you had more than one revenue stream. So if you were making TV shows and you were a studio, you were deficit financing every episode, every series. So the network, they would uh, basically rent the show. I mean, NBC rented Cheers from Paramount. And then they, you know, they got to show it three times in a year for free. And, uh, and then the rights reverted back to Paramount, and Paramount collected them in stacks and then sold the stacks to 200 TV markets around the country. So just imagine that. That was great money, right? One episode, you get paid uh, by the network to make it. You, usually it was less that you over time was it, it got but you started it was a deficit and then you get the reruns you sell the reruns 200 times you know so you have 200 episodes 200 times 200 times a million and it starts to get really interesting the monies were pretty good right um now you don't have that uh you have unlimited store width unlimited um bandwidth so it, I, the comparison i would use is the music business right in the old days music competed with other new music because, um, you know, like you're going to get up and you're going to go over there where the records are, or the CD rack is that you got it from Curtain Barrel, and you're going to get new, the old CD and you're going to put it in the CD changer. It's like, no, that's too hard. People don't, that's the other thing, people don't like to change. Um, you competed with new music. Because your old music was in the thing, and it was like the by the time that even the CD thing it was like fuzzy, it's hard to see the spine, and you didn't you didn't put it back in alphabetical order like you said you were gonna. Um, so you could never find what you wanted. So you just put new music competed with new music, and that was that. But when it's unlimited store width, so everything is the same choice. Now it's mu music, new music competes with all the music that has ever been recorded in the history of recorded music, and it drives a giant hole through the business, which is what happened in the music business. It wasn't that so much that people weren't buying it or whatever. It was more just that like, I can listen to anything I want. And maybe tonight, today, right now, I want to listen to that, you know, I want to listen to uh, Rubber Soul, which I can't, I can't even remember where it was on my CD rack that I got at Crate and Barrel in 1991. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to the audience, uh, and as we're setting up that, um, and Jackie, can you have the first questioner stand up? But uh, as we're setting up the uh, camera for that, Rob, was there a TV show that made you want say, I want to work in TV? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was some combination of those great comedies in the 70s, like... Um, Taxi, or uh, or like uh, Faulty Towers. Um, the idea that you could you could come up with characters and they'd be funny over time and funny twenty six or sometimes twenty eight times a year. Um, but I but I think for in terms of comedy comedy, the, the 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 thing I remember the most was one night in the summer. And I must have been 10, maybe 11. Uh, and I was in swimming in the swimming pool. We lived in Northern California, had a pool and a swimming pool. And my brother came home from seeing a movie called Airplane. And he said, this is the funniest movie I've ever seen in my entire life. And he goes and he tells me all of the jokes from the movie Airplane. And if you're like 11, like I was on the floor. Like, my brother cannot tell a joke, right? 
He's not a funny person, but this was funny. And I said, I got to go see this movie. Went to see it the second time the next day. I already knew all the jokes. And I, I was on the floor laughing at the movie Airplane. And be, not because it was um, revolutionary, but because it was giving me permission to laugh at something that I didn't know that I thought was funny. Like, I didn't know that I that these disaster movies that I had been watching were stupid and funny, but I knew there's something weird about them, but I didn't know what it was. And then these guys came along and gave us permission to laugh at them. And I'm thinking that that's a good, that's a really good gig. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, go to the first question. Rob, um, you mentioned the, the genre of comedy. Uh, it's, it's been a while since uh, there's been a really good comedy that's come out, I think. Um, and I mean, I guess the sensibilities of screenwriting tend to lag kind of popular culture by a few years, given the production cycle of, of Hollywood films. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's pretty well acknowledged that, you know, three or four years ago is kind of when maybe we reached this, this, you know, it's debatable, but People call it peak wokeism, if you will, or peak woke, right? The the time when sensibilities became so finely attuned that nothing you there was nothing permissible that was funny. So when when is that going to end? Well, I will be an ordained Episcopal priest by the time that happens. Uh, I don't know, but like we all, everybody in this room has had has said this, thought this, had this said to them, had a conversation like where, where the phrase begins. Well, they couldn't do that now. And sometimes it was they couldn't do that now, and it's like some like horribly racist thing from a 1937 movie. You're like, no, oh, they couldn't do that now. But sometimes it's something that happened 18 months ago that you couldn't do that now. So I'm not really sure. I don't know. I I think it's a, two things, right? There's there's fear, um, and then there's kind of the woke sensibility which creates fear, right? Which is like everyone agrees it's gone too far in show business. There's nobody saying, oh, it's great, oh, it's gone too far. But I don't want to be the first guy. I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to be, I don't want, I'm not the first. Um, and then the third thing is just, you, you, comedies you can't plan, right? I mean, it's hard now to remember because you've seen the movies. But if you didn't, hadn't seen the movie Anchorman and you read the script for Anchorman, you'd say, the fuck is this? <laughs> right? Like, this, this is shit. I don't know. He's like, what? Is this even real? What is this? Is it funny? But if it's like, if I say, okay, it's a script, read it, whatever. It's Will Ferrell, and he's got all his friends, in it, and it's going to be really funny, and just do it. Just make it. Then you you think, okay, well, Will Ferrell's kind of funny. Like, I mean, Zoolander. You read the script of Zoolander. It's hard now, because you know the movie. You read the script, and you're like, I know everything that happened in the movie. You read the movie, and you're like, they read the script, like, what the hell is this? I don't, is this funny? I don't even, it doesn't seem funny. But it's like Ben Stiller has got an idea. These are funny people. So you just, you take a flyer on the talent and you trust that it's going to probably be great. It might not be. It may be a giant disaster, but okay. Then you swing again. But there was a time not that long ago where every single summer had two or three big feature comedies that people went to see and they talked about them and then they like you know they the, the catchphrases were everywhere and they were gonna they were in a, they were in production for the sequel by labor day and um it's hard to believe that that took guts but it took guts i guess because they don't do it now and it's like are you kidding me like it's a no-brainer a big loud noisy summer comedy where like Will Ferrell's screaming at somebody and John C. Riley's in it and it's Talladega Nights, which is still a really funny movie. Like, why aren't we doing that? Like what it's like a self-own. It's like a it's like a it's like a economic suicide. It's like this 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 is what we do in show business. And we don't do that. And the answer to your question is I have no idea. But it's gonna take someone, I mean, I think there's money out there, someone just taking a risk and saying, what if we put it, what if we just made a funny comedy? Just that. It's not going to make you a better person. It's not going to make you rethink something. It's going to be funny. What about that? And I bet you that person's going to make a billion dollars. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, is Jesus a Republican? <laughs> no. 
Uh, a libertarian? Nope. Uh, unfortunately, no labels. Yeah, no labels. Yeah, I, I you know, uh, he's probably a really, 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 really bleeding heart liberal, and it drives people crazy. But it's kind of what he is, I think. Um, and the good news is built into the Christianity is the idea that you're, I'm going to fail at it anyway, so I can say he's a big bleeding heart liberal. I can't, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not like no way. Um, he did have that bit about rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? In the, yeah, that was the no labels yeah. part. That was the more of the I'm not part of this this yeah. uh, charade you guys are playing. Um, but yeah, I mean, unfortunately, for conservatives. Hmm. Okay. Next question. See, Jesus ends every conversation. Yeah. See, like this. Mm. I guess the next question is, was the Glock movie a comedy? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it was all it was a tragedy and terrible, and we have to, whatever, we have more regulation and all that stuff, whatever. But uh, yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, you were talking about how in the olden days, Baywatch, the, um, they were going producer was going to do a version of Baywatch on the border with only the happy stuff and that that was how things were done. So what does it mean that we now have all of these dystopian uh, films and all of these anti-heroes and all that? So what changed and, uh, and how does that affect what, what it's made? What does that say about the culture? I don't know about the dystopian stuff. I think it's we're just happier being unhappy. But you notice the dystopian, like um, when New York City was this shitty cesspool for real. Um, the movies about it uh, were sort of matter of fact in a way, right? It was like, well, you know, things aren't gonna get any better. This is the way it is. Uh, taxi driver makes total sense. It's not dystopian. It's like, oh, this is the way it is. I, it's I documentary know. realism. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, taking a Pelham one, two, three, it's a crazy moment where like the guy is holding a giant subway car hostage. He's gonna kill everybody. And then the guy who is the, the cop in charge, uh, when someone says, oh my God, we have to give him the money, otherwise he's gonna kill everybody. And he goes, what do they want for that lousy 20 cents to live forever? Or whatever it was, right? <laughs> Super dark, yeah. right? But nobody said, oh, that's a very dystopian view. They said, no, it's New York City in 1974. And then uh, New York City got really nice. And they cleaned up Times Square and you can sit outside and there's a, like a little panini place. And, and that's when all the dystopian movies started. Like, like if you watch these Batman movies, which I hate because I have no imagination, so don't come at me. I just they're always like the dystopian New York City. Like, are you kidding me? It's like a, it's the nicest place in the world. It hasn't been dystopian since 1991. It's like a, there's a there's a Chipotle and a, the Cooples <laughs> and then like a thing. And it's like, what are you worried about? Like, it's nice. Like, there's an M and M store. And why are we? What's th that? May be the dystopia. You may not like that. But it's not like, oh, my God, it's so dark. And, like, there's the, the soul of the city. That doesn't, hasn't been around for, you know, years. People now, like, young people, because I can, you know, I can say this now because I'm not one. You're a show running Yeah, veteran. I'm a show running veteran. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 uh, they complain about shit in New York City. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I get it. That's a crazy bird. I get it. That's bad. But, like, 1990, there were people getting shot and you're getting mugged and no radio in car signs like that was dystopian you could walk across Tompkins Square Park and like you you crush vials under your shoes like it was like you're walking on snow and now like uh, you know Tompkins Square Park it's like this got a you get a 6 dollar bottle of a cup of coffee and a vegan everything burger like come on so i don't know i just think we 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 are we we if there, if 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 the world is shitty and dystopian, and we live in a world of scarcity and things are going downhill, then I am not called to love my neighbor because, like, I don't have time for that. So I kind of prefer that world, in a weird, perverse way. Uh, let's do two more up front. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, we've got one in the back. Excuse, no, 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 no. We have a system. <laughs> oh no, so sorry. We have you a system. Oh, accuse okay. me of nepotism. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a question for Rob. Um, in the days of Cheers, it seems like even though there was a lot of political di divide, we were much less polarized. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, 
polarization and what, like why we're so polarized now and what the role of entertainment could be in perhaps um, uniting us and creating more unity in the world. Anybody else? Um, uh, first of all, okay, full disclosure, um, I, I think we've never been more polarized than we are now, but we're not as polarized as people think. Um, and I think once you atomize entertainment, and so you get you get your own entertainment the way you get your own news. Well, we're, that's well, you know that's the world of the two share, the one share, the million viewers. That's it's a hard way to it's a hard way to make a living. Like it's a it's a tough business to be in, as the shareholders of Warner Brothers Discovery and all these other places are discovering. Like you, you start going for a million people, and you're trying to make make them squeeze some kind of money out of like these tiny audiences, it's tough. Um, but you don't have to actually, entertainment doesn't have to actually heal anybody or bring anybody together. All we have to do is depict reality. I mean, All in the Family, which is this great, funny show, although you watch it now and you think, oh, it's so dated. It didn't, I mean, and, and, and Norman Lear took a position, like he thought that we should all, you know, we should all be like Meathead. I don't know how old you are, but remember that? And the American people watched it and said, that's funny. I'm not going to be like that weirdo. I'd rather be like Archie Bunker because he's got a job and he <laughs> pays for the food that they're eating, right? Um, you just have to depict reality, which means you kind of have to live in reality, which is a hard thing to do now in America because rich people just don't know anybody who's not rich. They just, you just don't know anybody. And there's a generation, two generations, three generations of people in show business now who are like, well, I went to... I went to Yale, and I know all my Yale friends. And so you can start pitch meetings. But Don't like, they know anyone who went to Brown? <sighs> Help me out. What is Brown again? Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, so I feel like the way you – the way you, uh, our job is not to depolarize America. Our job is not to heal America. Our job is not to bring people together. That's a, Those are terrible jobs, and we're not going to be able to do it anyway. All we have to do is like be honest about the things that are happening around the kitchen table or in a house or in our neighborhood and make jokes about it because they're funny because the the worst most tragic things are the funniest things and and let the other let 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 it let let it solve itself i mean we we get into trouble in show business when we are have we have an outcome other than entertaining surprising the audience with um with a reflection of their own concerns, loves, hates, arguments, triumphs. When we decide, oh no, and now I'm gonna do that, but I also want you to recycle or <laughs> vote for Trump, Biden, whatever. That's when we're like in unfunny territory and the audience smells it a mile away. So that's my answer, which is not an answer I recognize. Uh, final question. Sure. Uh, so we've run out of scarcity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So how do people then follow Jesus with the coats? Because everybody's got a coat. Everybody's got a coat. Um, I don't know. You've been working on that the whole evening, <laughs> haven't you? Like I've got That's to... not fair. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're not a believer in Jesus, are you? No, the other team. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you just... But what are the implications then? Um, uh, in my faith, uh, I'm just called to try. Every day I fail. And every day I try. And if you'll permit me, seeing as we're... Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Everybody just... Everybody just... <laughs> Um, there's a Rumi poem I love, which I can't find now, thanks to somebody. Um, well, there's a there's a there's a Saint Teresa prayer, right? Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. 
you do what you can do. All right. Uh, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank Rob Long for talking to Reason. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks very much.